I, uh, I'm very happy to be uh, chairing this session with uh, Julia Pongratz, Konstanze Rossmann, and Helmut Trischler. And um, Michael John Goldman said at the very beginning that the idea behind the center is a triangle to bring together researchers, health experts, and practitioners. And I think we, we have, uh, with the three panelists, a wonderful triangle. We have a natural scientist, uh, social scientist, and um, somebody, a, a humanity scholar who is also a media uh, expert, museum expert. Um, I think we have a, a great group of people who will discuss. Now, this is without a chat. It's 45 minutes. It's so-called concluding discussion. I don't know how you can conclude this, but uh, it will be hopefully a very lively um, discussion. And I can tell you, it's not choreographed. We have not preset questions. We are going to be uh, talking to each other over the next uh, 40 something minutes, 42 minutes or so. Um, and um, just very briefly, uh, Julie Pongratz is here at LMU Munich. She's a geographer who is an expert on climate research uh, and uh, is also affiliated with the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. She works on land use issues, among other things. Konstanze Rossmann will be, and we are excited about that, affiliated with LMU Munich. She's still, uh, we're going to kidnap her from a current institution, which is Erfurt University. She is the uh, science communicator, but the great thing is that she is also a health expert. So she's been working on uh, uh, health uh, communication over the last few years at the University of Erfurt. And Helmut Trischler is wearing many hats. And I think today he's wearing at least uh, two hats as an expert on, he's an expert on the Anthropocene, he's a, a, a scholar of, a historian of science technology, uh, but he's also the head of research at Germany's largest uh, museum, uh, the Deutsches Museum, so he also is wearing the hat of the, of the, uh, yeah, the media that communicate science uh, uh, and the science about the, um, about the um, uh, our topic, which is planetary health, and which is so difficult. Everybody has mentioned it. So many people have mentioned it this afternoon. And maybe that's what I find the most exciting thing that is so difficult. Uh, we've called it a wicked problem. We've called it, uh, I mean, it sounds like you know, the, com communicating the planet, communicating health on so many different issues with so many different meanings, uh, not the humans alone and not uh, climate alone and not health. And uh, uh, this makes it, I think, exciting, but it also makes it necessary to bring together uh, different uh, disciplines. And I think that's what we um, are bringing together here in order to try and define what planetary health might mean and what, how we can communicate it. And I would just, i uh, like to ask the three of you to uh, tell us what you see as a challenge and what you see as an opportunity when it comes to this term of planetary. And maybe you can tell us uh, what makes it exciting, what makes it difficult to think about the planetary dimension of planet health. Uh, thinking about the planet, about something huge, has advantages, but also challenges. So, Julia, can I ask you to start? Thanks, Christoph. Um, so, so planetary, I, I feel very much at home with this term coming from the natural science side with climate change and ecosystems. It seems natural to us and it means a couple of things. So, so on the one side, that there's the Earth system. So, so this planetary connects the different spheres of the Earth, which are natural, but uh, it may, it's also including uh, biogeochemical cycles, biophysics. It includes um, biology and it includes humans also very naturally. And, and in climate science, of course, you can't think without the humans. Um, the planetary term also connects scales, I think. So um, we've got global climate problem, we've got global climate negotiations, but we've got local adaptation. We, we need to have action implemented on the ground and small things. And I think planetary different from global connects these global and local and all scales in between very nicely. And um, in a more abstract way, I think the, the planetary also um, encompasses all disciplines in research that we have on the planet Earth. And so this is a key too that we really span these dis different disciplines, go to a transdisciplinary approach to tackle the problems. Um, and, and so I think um, it, it's, it's um, a very good concept in a way that it, it shows the complexity of the problem that you really need to consider all these different spheres and how they interact. But this is of course also the challenge. It's so big, it makes it clear that there cannot be a, a simple solution. Wonderful. Great start, Julia. Uh, 
I, you, you mentioned that it's uh, natural for you as a geographer, but I think it's much less natural for Constanze. I think it's a big challenge for communication scientists. At least that's what, what I uh, would imagine. Constanze, can you tell us uh, where you see the opportunities and challenges? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, first of all, I have to say, it, you mentioned already that I come from the, 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 the health domain. I have to admit, I'm not a health aspect, so I, I don't have any medical education or something like that. I'm really uh, I'm a communication science person with um, expertise in health communication. So just to make this clear, um, then coming, coming to my view on, on on planetary. Um, so I think the advantage here is uh, that the, the, the word, it, it broadens our perspective. It broadens our perspe uh, perspective on, 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 on our planet, of course. So just like uh, astronauts go to space and, and look at the Earth from outer space, or self-made astronauts uh, did uh, in the last weeks, like Branson and Bezos, now uh, claiming themselves astronauts. They see the Earth from, from outer space and have a different view of the Earth and, and also have a, have a view that is positively loaded. And I think this is some, a chance about this word, uh, planetary, that is positively loaded, um, just as compared to when we use the, 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 the word climate, climate change, it's more like uh, uh, in the meantime has been loaded sort of negatively. So maybe if you start using the, the word planetary more, we are able to, to load this whole area more positively for the people in communication. Um, also thinking um, from a planetary perspective, I think um, means also thinking globally. We heard that already. For me, this also implies, um, which is really, really important to um, broaden our perspective that we often have um, as Western cultures Western people uh, to broaden our perspective and include non-Western societies, which is really important, include different cultures also when we communicate our problems, which is not easy. So this is also a challenge uh, at the same time. And, and then we um, heard from, from Sam Myers already. So the, the interconnection between planetary and health uh, gives rise uh, to the relationship so he said human health impact is impact, impacted by natural systems. But you could uh, just say the other way around, it's also that health behavior will affect nature. And, and this interdependency um, is again a chance in communication. So you might use uh, the argument to protect nature um, as an argument to, to, to behave more healthily. To, to promote your health, or just the other way around, you can use the argument of uh, nature impacting health uh, to, to, to pro protect society, right? And so uh, this is, again, a challenge, uh, but uh, also, also, also an advantage of this work. Wonderful, Constanze, thank you. Uh, Helmut, historians can talk about anything and everything, especially if you are a historian who is uh, worked on, on a big concept like the Anthropocene. Where do you see the opportunities and challenges? Yeah, as a historian, I would answer, are we so proud as historians of having finally reached a global perspective. Global history is very much on bulk. Uh, we managed uh, to see social connections from a global perspective, uh, bridging the regions, and yeah, uh, leapfrogging forward uh, into a globality. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we as historians or humanities people actually be still very much focused on the social sphere. And I'm talking about spheres, if you wish, the social spheres and the cultural sphere. And we've not yet really uh, come to a, a grips of the other spheres that are around us, the atmosphere, the biosphere, actually, although in environmental humanities, we talk about, uh, let's say, multi-species, still we very much focus on our species, the human species, not to speak of, uh, of the technosphere. So these interrelations, these contact connectivities between the different sphere is, uh, I think, uh, that what we need and that what we discuss uh, actually in, uh, in planetary health perspectives. 
Um, and that's that's what I really see yeah? that we that we uh, are overcoming this uh, being only focused of one of those spheres that make the connectivities and make the complexities uh, of uh, modern science. We've uh, heard that we have talked about Earth system science, but still, in some sense, we rely on the success model of modern science, which means uh, modern science is, is based on a continuous process of fragmentation, of uh, being, um, uh, being segmented in, in fields, in subfields, in sub-subfields to deal with the complexity of, of the reality. And this is, this is what is continuously um, taking place, but we have to, yeah, Re, uh, redirect that pr uh, process. We have to come, uh, what some of us say in, in the humanities, to a kind of new mode of knowledge production, actually. One is that by, is by definition interdisciplinary, breaking these barriers, and, and also transdisciplinary. I think these are the challenges that I see, but also the, well, the problems. Yeah, um, in a way, uh... Uh, so Myers was saying that uh, human exceptionalism is a myth, and that that seems to be. I mean, I can imagine that's super difficult for a communication scientist. It's very difficult for for his for a social historian, impossible to deal with that. For a social historian, a political historian, an environmental historian are trying to go there. Uh, I'd like to ask a question that um, deals with the fact that. Helmut, you just mentioned interdisciplinarity and the need, and Julia mentioned before that uh, we actually have to work with all disciplines. Julia, you said with all disciplines, and I think you are right. I think it's, uh, and there are not that many topics where we feel uh, that it's helpful to bring together all, all the uh, disciplines. At the same time, I'm wondering, maybe you can address that, uh, whoever wants to go first. Uh, when you think about this project that we are launching and that we are part of over the next few years, which disciplines uh, do you think, uh, you know, it's, it's like jumping over a fence. I, I don't like the silo. I like fences, you know, jumping over a fence. You're, we're all in one field. Let's go into other fields. Uh, let's go places where we haven't been. Could you address some of the fields? Uh, think of some of the fields that you uh, are excited about uh, understanding in order to uh, look at that from that field into your own field. So the question of uh, interdisciplinarity. Julia? Um, in in um, climate change science, there's, there's a big push currently that, that we need um, more, more solutions to draw down CO2 and so on. And all of these methods in the end that are viable currently will be based on land. So afforestation, biomass plantations, and so on is all something that has to happen on the land. And then there happens to be people living there, which is a problem for us natural scientists. But we now understand that we need to deal with that. And while we can beautifully um, quantify what potentials you have with planting a forest there and drawing down CO2, you may plant that forest even because you can convince policymakers it's, it's worth it. But five years later, it may be cut down because you have forgotten that there's a local um, farmer who has to live off that land. And so um, we, we now realize that. And we also have methodological um, advances now that we can get to really high resolution in our assessments. And so these, these global scale modeling that we usually do to see what are the solutions to climate change to bring down CO2, we now get to this local scale that's relevant. And there are the big pushes now to get the social sciences com combined with the natural sciences. So those people understanding really how are behavioral dynamics of societies, of individuals, what are the stakeholders on the ground? How do they behave? Why do they behave? Why don't they behave quickly enough? which is a problem because then the natural system also acts slowly and you have a, a whole cascade of delays in the system. And this makes me excited because over the last um, decade, we really learned to speak each other's language. And now we can implement um, that into trying really to, to get sustainable solutions there on the ground. And I think this is, this is a strong way forward, but we have spoken with socioeconomic um, sciences in the past that was easier, so economists, they know equations the same way um, the natural scientists do. But we now realize, so this was just by chance that we, we always get a preference to economics there in these fields. But it's really about the social and behavioral dynamics as well. And this makes me excited for you. 
Shall I go second? Um, I think Constance was, uh, was uh, whatever, whoever wants to go second, yeah. Go ahead, I would. Okay, uh, the problem with wicked problems is that you don't foresee what kind of knowledge is you need to solve the, this uh, wicked problem a, a priori. So in that sense, you know, we need all the disciplines. We, we, can't, we can't say this is more important than the other one. Just uh, to embark on what Julia just said, uh, um, well, the, uh, well, let's say we need behavioral sciences. Yeah, we know how to get a bit deeper understanding why people change their behavior. But in order to do so, we need psychologists uh, having uh, experts on ethical questions on board, also economics, uh, e economists, et cetera, et cetera. You, I, I can go further and further. Uh, so it's uh, this, um, again, there is no, there is no hierarchy of- I'm gonna ask you what would excite you personally? Oh, okay. My, my personal excitement in this case would really be behavioral sciences. Um, uh, earlier today, I said, Sarah, was it uh, a little bit stimulated by my question? We need a better understanding of target groups uh, when it comes to audience research. But uh, to, to get this better understanding, again, uh, you need beha psychology, you need behavioral sciences. And I think uh, in some sense, to me, that would be wonderful if we had this opportunity, right? To, to see really the, yeah, I mean, target group is the wrong word, I would say, the public, uh, the different publics that we con continuously try to uh, reach with our participatory, um, yeah, toolkit. So in that sense, yeah, the, these are disciplines that I think are unavoidable to talk to. Stanze? Yeah. Um, thank you. It, it, it was a per perfect role, uh, uh, actually, because um, what I wanted to say perfectly fits into that. Um, so, first of all, I, I would say, um, from my perspective, I'm really excited about really working with uh, natural scientists now and uh, ecologists, because um, when we communicate, we talked about that, we have to communicate um, on the best evidence we have there. So uh, this is the starting ground uh, for communication. And uh, of course, uh, working with the scientists who know this evidence is really important because we, we, we really can find out what is the evidence out there. And, and then the next step uh, for me, um, you mentioned already behavioral sciences. So as a communication person, um, uh, communication science is interdisciplinary in itself, how it developed as a field. And we actually do include behavioral um, models. We do include um, um, political science. We do include different perspectives. And uh, so when I uh, work on health campaigning, um, I really do work with, with behavioral theories. I work with um, knowledge about um, uh, which media channels do people use. Uh, and um, about which appeals are effective. And, and this is really important to be broad in this sense in order to make good, uh, I, I call it strategic communication today. I learned many, some people do, do not like this wording so much uh, to talk about strategic communication. I think it's not a mean world. <laughs> it's, it's not a wicked word to talk about strategic communication. It's just about how uh, we learn to make good communication. And as you said, um, being, being target specific, tailoring communication to different people is really important here. Uh, I want to talk too much about that, but we, uh, I guess we go into this later uh, also. But then the next step for me, which is crucial here in this group also, is to be able to, to work with, with museums because it's another way to uh, reach out to people. So normally being a communication person, I talk about media channels. I talk about interpersonal communication, but not so much about these new ways of reaching out to publics. And I think this is really important because uh, we can learn so much from each other. Um, you mentioned the, 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 the word participatory. So this is really an important word also in health campaigning. And, and, and so um, we can make participatory uh, approaches come to life in a museum setting. Julia, is it, yeah. is it 
uh, is it uh, campaigning or strategic communication? That what we, for example, the two of us are doing in, in the new project that you are a consortium leaders, uh, CDL Sintra, which is about uh, you know carbon capturing and storage and trying to communicate, get a get a better understanding of what what that means, uh, and trying to communicate this to uh, the public, um, to a large audience. Is that? Uh, and it is funded, it's funded by the federal government, by the federal ministry of research and education. So do we do strategic communication for the ministry or how would you frame our project in this? Uh, maybe this, uh, because I, I, I really think this is an important issue. How can we keep our, if you, if you wish our independence uh, here when it comes to such larger consortiums to such agenda that are obviously in some sense related to power uh, to political interests? That's a very good question. Um, I hope the, the BMBF is not listening when, when I'm saying that um, I think no. So I think we're doing research about the communication we are doing. I think this makes our project special. So with, with what, what is being planned in the Deutsches Museum, for example. So there's going to be exhibitions, but then also people analyzing how they are perceived. And I think in that sense, it's very clear that it's not, um, not strategy first, but really um, to see what works and what does not work. And it's, it's very open, right, um, too. So the project itself, I must also say, there's no pre-selection of methods, for example, that we're looking into. It could be putting CO2 into the oceans, in, into, the, into the land, whatever different types of methods. So it's very democratic in that sense, too. And therefore, I think we're not advocating anything specific. But of course, it's strategic in a way that we want to raise awareness of of the problem itself, climate change, everyone's aware of that, but, uh, but what um, can be done and how, how urgent action is and try educate on, on that field wherever it's possible also convey where solutions can be done by those seeing, for example, the exhibitions. So, so it's somewhere yeah. in between. Or to pay tribute or to have in mind from the beginning and always, you know, remind ourselves that this is a case that um, uh, knowledge, new knowledge, science, if you wish, is always open, contested, uh, fragmented, uh, has to be negotiated. Uh, so this this is obviously one of the you know, necessary prerequisites of such a let's say non-strategic uh, science communication that uh, uh, um, is really um, also um, uh, taking taking the participatory element seriously and not uh, seeing the public uh, as an instrument, but really you know, uh, having see, seeing the pub, public as an independent knowledge producer. Maybe I can follow up on that. I mean, I, I think it's interesting this whole discussion about, you know, uh, strategies and about sponsors on one hand, but all of you have used words like the public multiple times and like the people, we have to reach to the people. I'd like to know from you who you have in mind when you, when you think of communicating planetary health to the people. Uh, and I, I mean, we've uh, in the very first paper today, we heard about that we should address young audiences in particular. Um, I mean, museums has, have, have their specific uh, audiences in mind. As professors, we have audiences. Uh, um, but I, maybe you can all address that the question of, of audience and planetary health and how you think about the audiences. Constanze? Yeah, so um, I would like to start with, uh, first of all, I have in mind the uh, really laymen, the individual people who are laymen in this field and um, who we want to inform um, about certain aspects um, related to planetary health um, and who we maybe want to um, uh, influence in a way that they change uh, their behavior uh, in a positive way. Um, and then when we have this said, uh, we have to think, okay, okay how can we um, segment this audience? How can we segment uh, these laymen? And there are a whole lot of several possible segmentation criteria. So one is age, which is really typical. You mentioned uh, young people that we want to address. Then there are older people, of course. Uh, but there are also people with low um, health literacy um, or higher health literacy. There are people with low education and higher education. And you can go on and on and on and on. 
And the important thing about it is we really have to think um, about our target, uh, about our audience in target groups because um, to say um, maybe um, young people, if we talk about uh, um, uh, COVID-19 protection behavior. So um, we all remember the typical strategy to reach out to people at the beginning of the pandemic was a social appeal to say, okay, you have to protect uh, you have to, to, to use protection measures in order to protect the older people, to, to protect other ones. Um, but actually, we, we, we conducted a study for the Federal Ad, uh, Agency for Health Promotion, BZGR, in order to find out how can we really convince young people to, to engage in, in, in COVID protection behavior. And what we found out that uh, was that the social aspects didn't play a role for them engaging in behavior, rather risk perceptions. So uh, younger people who had a high risk perception of, of, um, and, of having severe consequences of, 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 of getting a COVID-19 um, infection, they were rather, um, uh, in, rather intended to, to engage in self-protection. Um, so, so this is just an example to show you we really have to get to know our target group. And this argument, this aspect of risk perception, we know now for young adolescents uh, and young people, but it might be a quite different argument to reach out to uh, older people, to convince older people. And you can, can use many, many, many examples in all different areas uh, that show, okay, the, the determinants, the drive behavior might be very, 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 very different among different target groups. And therefore, it's so important not to think about one general audience, but uh, about segmented audiences. And you can uh, also talk about how you um, reach them, like what media do they use? Do we reach them by a um, traditional mass media or do we reach them by a digital media and so on? And this is all target group specific. I can only second you, Constanze. If I use the word public, then uh, I have to correct myself. There is no such thing as the public. There's always publics in the plural. Um, and that's what we're doing also when it comes to visitors research and audience research in museums. We break that entity of the public uh, down into different segments, be it along uh, age groups, be it along individual uh, uh, visitors or group visitors. And there's very different, uh, let's say, worldviews and, and processes of learning uh, from a museum visit. Then we have to break it down into kind of general audience, an attentive audience, and an interested audience. But the problem is always you only get those who come to the museum, who have a certain, yeah, uh, certainly biased because they're interested uh, in some, in some sense sense, whereas the majority doesn't come. Um, uh, so what we uh, mentioned that earlier in one of the uh, discussions, what we, and that's, uh, I think, consensus, but very difficult to reach, we have to go extra mural, we have to go out of our containers of our mur of our walls, right, to, to reach uh, uh, the, the non-attentive uh, audience uh, that, that usually doesn't talk about a science that is not receptive to uh, any kind of, of science and, and to reach that and try to be, get a better understanding of this majority of the, uh, of the society is, is, most is most important but most difficult also. But I, I think that's what we have sweared ourselves that we would like to do um, in our uh, agenda for the, for the years to come. But as said, uh, uh, it's difficult and we have to constantly remind ourselves uh, to do so and, and not get the easy way. Yeah? Those who already come, those who, who are we, uh, uh, we are in touch with and in conversation with. It also seems like we are a congregation. We seem to all have the same opinion today, and that that is is tricky. You know, uh, you know. At the end of the film, uh, it's I think uh, what what uh, the uh, narrator said was, "We know what to what to do. Why don't we do it?" I mean, we know it, but uh, it's a question of who 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 uh, who do we want to convince? Uh, really, uh, do you have a special audience in mind when you think about planetary health? Um, as a geographer, as a climate researcher? 
my colleagues made it very clear that there's, there's heaps of different audiences. And this is also true for, for climate research. So, so there's the, the, this triangle of the individuals who have a lot of choices, for example, dietary choices, if they fly to New York or not. But then there's, of course, there needs to be the right political framing around it to make choices possible. In these cases I just mentioned, they are possible. In others, if you don't have, um, if you can't um, charge your, your electric car, that's not something you, you have in your hands. So there, of course, needs to be political um, decisions around it to make it possible. And then, of course, there's, there's industry. So companies will only act when policy is right, policy only acts when the voters support them and so on. And so there's these three main tar um, target groups, which as Constantin made very clear are so heterogeneous in themselves. So we, for example, try to address in particular on the individual side and schools. So we go out to school, speak with students because we, we think there's a lot of things we can explain from our science side and on that level still and they're, they're willing and, and so on. Um, but we are very aware this is just a very small group and we are eager to learn more about how to convince other types of groups. And when you mentioned, um, Christoph, the, 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 the excellent movie by, by, by Sam Meyer's um, team, um, I, I was thinking in the end, exactly so, so the urgency should now really be clear. And also that we need to do something. But I, I had the feeling it leaves um, people still alone with what exactly do I do? as an individual, as the head of a big company, as a politician. So this concrete action, because it's so target specific, of course, cannot be conveyed in something like this, but I think it's essential if you want to make a change to, to fill this gap of how to really make that action for the specific target group. I can see that both Constanze and Helmut would like to jump in again. Can, can I ask you, when you, uh, with, with your next um, statement or discussion points, that you also include, now we've talked about, you know, that is research design and about audiences, uh, but part of communication, of course, is, is our arguments. And we've heard about, all of you have used the word argument, actually, and how do you argue? And there are people like uh, Sprachforscher who say, you know, uh, like Richard Rorty, who will say arguments are, are useless. Uh, it is not, uh, we, we used to believe in arguments. We know today that, that arguments don't work. Uh, what is needed is a new way of talking. And uh, we've heard the word story today. So can you, uh, in whatever you bring up next, also think about, you know, what are these good stories? How are they, uh, how, do you, how do you frame them uh, uh, with the audience in mind or with the speaker in mind? Constanze? Yeah. Um... Okay. Um, what I just wanted to say and, and add, but this uh, fits to it um, quite well, is um, when thinking about audiences, we also, what we didn't mention yet is we have to think about multipliers. Um, so um, we, we, in communication, we often talk about the two-step flow of communication for, for tens of, of years now. Um, and, and, and we know that sometimes when we want to reach the hard to reach people, uh, we use multipliers. And so uh, possible multiplier, we had the session before, are journalists, of course. We, we shouldn't forget the journalists who are also an, an important target group. Then possibly parents when we want to reach younger people. Or, or teachers in schools and so on and so on. Uh, in the context of, of health, we often um, have in mind uh, the, the physicians uh, or pharmacies who can be important um, multipliers to reach other people. Um, but then, okay, okay, the really, really, really hard question is, how do we tell the people? Um, how do we frame information? And this is again uh, as uh, hard to say as it is to separate and segment uh, the audiences. Uh, so I, I, just before I already mentioned that um, it is important to find out what drives behavior. Um, and, and this is um, this shows us that um, very often it is not about um, raising knowledge about an issue, because maybe knowledge is not the driving force of behavior, which is actually pretty often the case. Uh, but it could be like there, uh, as an example, one behavioral theory is the theory of planned behavior. And the three central determinants of behavior are attitudes, subjective norms, and perceived behavior control. So behavior depends on, do I think it's good or bad to behave in a specific way? 
uh, on what I, do I think other people think about it and do I think I'm able to change the behavior. And depending on the behavior in question, attitudes might be the driving force or the norms or the perceived behavior control. And this is what we have to find out. So um, it's not about basically knowledge all the time, but it might be to tell people how they are able to perform a behavior if this is the driving force and if they have problems in, 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 in performing the behavior, like lack of time maybe, or lack of money. And then this is the argument uh, you should use. Um, and then another thing is thinking about appeals. Um, a, 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 very well-known uh, form of appeal are fear appeals. And this is also very common in, in climate change and health communication. Think about, about smoking, uh, all cigarette packages have fear appeals, have, have these images with fear appeals. And then there's a lot and heaps of research out there that tells us how you have to use fear appeals. And if you consider this research, actually how fear appeals are used on tobacco packages is not really the right way. Because what we know is uh, if you have a fear appeal, you have to combine it at the same time with a self-efficacy appeal. So you have to tell people at the same time how they are able to change their behavior in order to protect themselves from, from the danger you talk about. And only with this com uh, combination uh, fear appeals can be effective. And now I come uh, also to the story aspect. Uh, actually, you, you can implement uh, this combination of, 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 of talking about risks and at the same time providing information about how you can protect yourself against this in a longer story, of course. Uh, and then at the same time, stories are narrative. And now we know from like how you perceive narratives, uh, you are more engaged in it. It's like reading a book, you get transported, you have a higher engagement. And this leads to um, more um, uh, attention, higher attention, better retention of, 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 of information. And in the end, possibly, um, better effects of, of such stories. That's how they work. And this is uh, actually why I would also support to say stories are a good way. So stories are important and knowledge is not so important. Can I say that provocatively, uh, especially uh, looking at Helmut Trischler, who is an expert in knowledge societies, so always emphasize the importance of knowledge. Helmut. Again, knowledge is in the plural, but that, that's not a point here. You touched upon a really crucial point, uh, Christoph. One that uh, obviously points to the fact that not only planetary health is a wicked problem, but science communication itself is a wicked problem with all, uh, you know, <laughs> specific problems that have uh, that you can discern. And one of them is really, I mean, to discern between, let's say, arguments and answers. Yeah, uh, at the Deutsches Museum, when we opened uh, our new center of, uh, center for New Technologies, we said, OK, we're not providing answers uh, to um, uh, to. Uh, under, uh, underline and stress uh, this openness of, of science, this contestation, contestation, we only provide arguments, but this is, this is only half of the truth because once you, once you do uh, design an exhibition, you give a narrative, you provide a certain answer, you take a certain stance. Uh, and I think it was one of the uh, lies of museums, the, let's say uh, 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 lies of existence, that they, they, they uh, in particular when it comes to science and technology museums, that they always stress, we are neutral, we don't take a stance, all right? We just provide arguments, if not uh, facts, probably arguments. No, no, you always take a stance. Uh, and, and, uh, such an exhibition, every narrative is normative. Yeah? So I, I think we have to, to become aware that, that there is normativity in all what we're doing. Um, uh, also to, you know, uh, to, to pay attention to the fact that uh, audiences, uh, the publics, do uh, trust in institutions such as museums. So there's institutional trust, trust there's authority, and you have to, uh, you, know, you have to understand your authority, uh, and otherwise, you know, you, you lose your credibility and, your, and trust. So it's, it's a wicked problem. So many exciting answers. Uh, I'd like to touch on a few other 
uh, unrelated topics because I think it's great to have the three of you there and different perspectives. I think that uh, COVID-19, this whole thing that started in March last year has changed us in some way to what extent we've digested it. I don't know, uh, we were thinking about it all the time. We're affected by it all the time. Does that, are there any lessons that you've learned over the last one and a half years that might have an imp uh, implication for planetary health uh, research? Any type, methodologically, um, in terms of behavior, in terms of communication, um, are you changing uh, your research agenda when it comes to global health uh, in light of what we've seen? I mean, obviously, I mean, there's animal, uh, you know, we, we've, we've seen uh, that, that uh, animal human relations are important uh, from an ecological viewpoint. Instanze, would you go first? Yeah. Um, there's one thing um, I wouldn't say that I've learned, but it, um, I, it was sort of confirmed again uh, what we knew before. So um, we all recognize that when COVID 19 happened, um, the issue was high on the agenda, uh, media agenda right away and also in people's perception uh, and and it was right away a very very important issue and people reacted to it politicians reacted to it because it was so so dangerous um and actually um i was asked by by journalists um what are the lessons learned from, from that for com communicating about climate change? And what I said is, well, the, 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 the difference between COVID-19 and climate change communication is um, people still perceive the consequences of climate change as being rather distant. So it's not something that is here right away, such as COVID-19. It's, it's, it's in future. It's, it's 10, 20, 30 years. It somehow changes now. So thinking about uh, what happens in Germany with the flooding and stuff, stuff like that. But still, many issues like, like higher temperatures, um, lack of food and stuff like that, they, they are far more distant. And what we know from risk perception research is that risks that have a, a higher distance, um, timely distance, um, are underestimated. Um, and this, this is a really important problem um, uh, that we need to think about and need to address. So we, um, I would say we cannot learn so much from a, a, a pandemic that is here right away, uh, right now, uh, for this problem. Mm -hmm. Julia? Um, so, so I think there's, there's two points that I found interesting with this, um, watching how that evolves with, with COVID and communication there. So the one point um, that's important, I think, is that we saw how decision making under huge uncertainties can work. And in the end was successful. And I think it was also something um, evident to, to, to the public. Everyone was watching, right? And was seeing the numbers don't add up in the beginning. How, what should we do? We need to do something. It's so urgent. Something was done. And in the end, it made more sense. And to see that whole procedure, even for, for scientists themselves to, to follow that and how the uh, how the doctors and the medical staff and so on, how they, how they did a great job in, in communicating that what they know with all the uncertainties on top and not and being transparent about that. I think that was really um, excellent. And this is something we should, we should carry on to all the other aspects of planetary health. Of course, many aspects because it's so complex, because there's so many interactions between all those different spheres, human and natural ones, um, there, there will be a lot of uncertainties, but we need to be transparent about them. And of course, there's often statements that go beyond these uncertainties and we need to focus on those. And often they're strong enough already to, to um, require action. And then you can leave away all these uncertainty discussion to some, some more detailed um, aspect. And the other part I found um, astounding is that um, we, we saw with, with all the recovery packages that were put in place to compensate for the economic degrowth during the pandemic, um, it's, it's huge amounts of money that were mobilized quickly. And so it, it may seem that, that um, tackling things that may cost something, at least in the short term, can be done if the urgency is communicated appropriately to 
using that word again, the public, everyone in, involved. And for, and for example, um, the, the um, recovery package globally, there were 10 times more money in those than you would need to transform the energy system to a way to be compatible with the Paris goals for the climate change agreements. Right? And so it's not a question about can we mobilize that money if it's made clear, it's urgent, it's pressing and it's affecting everyone, individually, societies, economics and so on, then it could be doable. And, and to, to transfer a bit of that into tackling um, planetary health issues, I could um, think would be very good. COVID-19 seems to be a turning point in many ways and perspectives. Um, in particularly, I think for science communication, it is already now we can we can observe that it has become a turning point. At the beginning, everyone said, uh, now is the hour of the expert, right? The expert is at center stage and he or she is asked uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, science is, uh, has become the, 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 the true uh, problem solver, et cetera, et cetera. Then science communicate, uh, communication researchers like Julia uh, and, and, and many others have noticed now there is there, science come, uh, scientists have a different, obviously a different standing in many ways. Uh, and, uh, and they are, let's say, their interrelations uh, with politics and uh, with the publics has become even more difficult than it uh, used to be. And there is no linear, uh, natural, uh, uh, let's say, um, a bargain between politics um, and, and, and science, even uh, as if it, it looks like uh, politics is following scientific advice, it's way more complicated. Uh, and I think that's what science communication research has already learned, uh, again, a wicked problem. I just wanted to quickly add, Christophe, if I may, um, I should say that, of, of course, the, the crisis also told us that each individual discipline has been very humble because it's so complex to provide solutions and, and therefore nobody can say they know the answer. And I think this is also something that became very clear that in the end, um, it's, it's policymakers that have a very, very hard job to combine all these different interests and have this big view. And that's, yeah, that's the wicked problems. Can I end this discussion? We've, we've we're already over time, but maybe I can uh, ask you one final question and I'll ask you for a very brief answer, because uh, on one hand, we've, uh, you've all emphasized the complexity of the uh, methodological um, complexity and the gravity of the problem. On the other hand, uh, we understand that we uh, and we, we uh, you've also emphasized how, how problematic the situation is currently and that we have to get out of a situation and we have to do things in order to get out of a very problematic situation. On the other hand, uh, we've been asked to think about simplification and we've been asked to find hopeful stories. Do you have any tricks? Do you have any ideas of you know, where could hope come from? A short answer? simple and hopeful stories is what we've been asked to provide. I know this is impossible to find a quick uh, answer, but whatever you say uh, will be appreciated. Julia? I, I like the story of the co-benefits and works in some respects. Constanze mentioned it doesn't work everywhere, right? But um, these health impacts, the, these co-benefits that you have of climate change measures, for example, on health, via air pollution, via dietary changes, more other type of mobility and so on. I, I think this is a sign of hope. It doesn't solve the entire problem, but it's in little steps, it can be advantageous to, to communicate. There's a whole lot of co-benefits for humans, for, for Earth in itself, for biodiversity and so on. I have an easy answer um, uh, because uh, Christoph is next to me, and, and his idea of slow hope is, uh, I think, very important here. That uh, you know, it's not the it's not the big story, and uh, uh, also uh, Michael John just mentioned uh, in this uh, chat, "Don't hope, cope." Yeah, uh, coping coping comes from or well, let's say it's it's based on uh, on some forms of pro uh, yeah, like providing. Uh, uh, Opening up uh, the, the the box of Pandora of 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 hope, right? Uh, so so not to end with the declensionist uh, uh, catastrophic uh, narratives, uh, but really uh, the the action, the 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 coping uh, the coping uh, uh, potential that comes from uh, providing some small little tiny hopes. Now I step in, if I may. 
Yes. Um, so I was going to say actually the same as Julia did. Um, so I, 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 I had to find something different. Um, but I think so. I, I think one sign of hope is this uh, day today, this symposium. Uh, we came together as a, as a really high diverse group and interdisciplinary group. We talked to each other and we listened to each other. And this is so important. Listen to each other. We had this uh, already just before listening to audiences, listen, listen to diverse audiences, but also listening to, to different disciplines. And I think that we came together and that uh, we hopefully will work together in future um, uh, gives rise to hope. I think this uh, has been a, a very transformative uh, discussion. Um, if I, uh, I, I was fascinated throughout this discussion, how you, in a way, really went beyond your disciplines, you know, uh, how Constance in the very beginning, you said, you know, you as a communication scientist were saying how important it is to look at the planet from the outside. I would have never expected a communication scientist to say that. And Julia was uh, uh, talking at one point like a philosopher and like an economist. And uh, of course, uh, Helmut also, uh, who is in a museum, a person who is talking about coping. I think uh, you've all transcended your traditional roles. And I think that is exciting. It gives us hope also into the, into the future. This is not a concluding discussion. I mean, some, I'm supposed to have led a concluding discussion. It, in the theater, the curtain closes, but then it opens again. And I think Michael John has said at the beginning, uh, there's a frame, uh, maybe we should think of it more uh, as a frame, then as a field, planetary health is a frame. And when the curtain opens again, I think there are many new things that we will have identified and seen just because of our great discussions in uh, over the last 50 minutes, but also throughout the whole afternoon. So please join me in thanking Constanze, Julia and Helmut, and thank you for everybody else for listening. <laughs>